This program was paid for by Water of Life Church. From Water of Life Ministries in Plano, Texas, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is speaking through his servants to the world. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today. Let us join Doyle Davidson and others of Water of Life, sowing the Word of God in spirit and in truth. Hello, I'm Doyle Davidson, servant and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, ministering locally to the body of Christ in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas, sent by God to your house to declare to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 tell us what the gospel is, how that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture, he is buried, and he rose again the third day, according to Scripture. Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, send me to heal the broken heart, preach deliverance to the captives, recover the sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised. The word is nigh thee, even in your heart, in your mouth is the word of faith, which I preach, you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved with the heart man believing under righteousness and with the mouth confession is made under salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is about God under salvation. Everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by his faith. I want to welcome everyone receiving this broadcast, a live stream, Roku, YouTube, or other devices. Paul Peters, my co-host, to my left. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Hallelujah. Thank God. You had something interesting to share today, I think. Yes. A doctrine or something like that. Yes. Well, the church, I'm going to have a drink of water. All right. Um, what's been in my heart is forgiveness or forgiving others and or unforgiveness. And there's one verse in Colossians that was quickened to me and kind of pricked my heart. I'll get to that. But first, I want to read from Matthew and Mark about what Jesus said about forgiving others. So starting in Mark 11, verse 22, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, Believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. So there you see, when you forgive others, you have to have faith when you forgive others. Because it says, believe in your heart that those things which you say it to come to pass. So you have to have faith when you forgive. And now, Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often should my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. There is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon... One was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, 
Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after they had called them, said to him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from the heart forgive not every one of his brother their trespasses. It's a pretty scary thing. If you don't forgive your brother, be delivered to the tormentors. Amen. And now the verse that was quickened to me, in, it's in Colossians chapter 3, and I'll start in verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. That last part was what's quick in me. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And this morning I was talking with Doyle, and I asked him when Jesus was on the cross, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Did that statement of forgiveness apply to us as well? And, well, based on what it says in Colossians, yes, it does apply to us as well. It didn't apply to the people who were crucifying him and mocking him and scourging him as well, but also applies to us because he was up on the cross. He had all our sins on him, and he still said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And so I know forgiving others is not easy. <laughs> but when I read this, as Christ forgave me, so also I should forgive others. That just pricked me in the heart. And because he bore all our sins, all our sicknesses, all our pains. So if, if someone gave you a broken heart, Jesus bore that on the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them. If someone lied to you, Jesus bore that sin on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. If someone lied about you, that, that's a sin. That sin of the lie bore, was on Jesus' body. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that just, it brought me to a, a place of humbleness and meekness. Because sometimes it's not easy to forgive. Uh-huh. When I read that, he had all our sins on him. And he still said, Father, forgive them. It's an incredible thing. Beautiful thing. Beautiful. Paul asked me a question because I think when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. Does that apply to us? I said, I never thought of it that way, but you've asked me a good question. Then he told me about Colossians. I said, I'd say absolutely. He forgave every one of us. Why? Because our sins were on him. Right? Amen. Now, you got any more to say? No. Something you just said really came alive in my heart. And that's Mark 11, 23 and 24. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast, be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. Is that right? That's right. What's next? But shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Then he goes on and talks about unforgiveness. Right. Did you know that mountain that needs to be removed could very well be unforgiveness in your heart? Right. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to say, I believe that's what all that is tied together for. Amen. I know one thing. For years, and I've had people not understand me, but I would just start praying and forgive people, just everyone 
that would come to my mind or heart, I just, Father, I forgive them and ask God to forgive them as an intercessor for them. Pray that God would forgive their sins. That's my, well, that's, well, that's a ministry of you, me, all of us that are in the position we're in is to intercede for forgiveness for people. That you have faith, I have faith that they'll be forgiven. And if, if they don't, in John chapter 20, it says, whosoever sins you retain shall be retained. Whosoever sins you remit shall be remitted. Sin is a problem with the church. Nothing but sin. And, well, unbelief is the sin, but unforgiveness is a very difficult sin, as you said, to forgive. I mean, it's not easy to forgive someone that just shot holes in you. Right. You know? Right. As a veterinarian, I had a, a very good practice. Most of it, well, the best part was equine or horses. And I had some colleagues that were very envious of me because of my practice. And I learned over the years things that I'd hear them say about me, they may have not said it. It may have been the person telling me what they said to try to stir me up. I knew this one guy, and he was just a tail bearer, bearer, and he was always telling me what certain vets were saying about me. And I learned don't let that bother you. It's not worth it. And I'd put it out of my mind and heart as quickly as I could. And I know now that was Jesus in me that gave me that wisdom to put it off. Amen. Amen. Well, what are we doing next? Did you want to talk about 1 Corinthians 15? If Christ be not risen? Oh, yes, please. Boy, my intellect's under, my soul is really under a great pressure, great attack. I tell you, there are times that I can't even think. And I have to pray and continue to pray, and then it'll come to me in the heart or even in my intellect. But last night, I did some posting about America. You see, I was born in 1932 and lived in southwest Missouri, Jasper County, born 22, 20 miles east of Joplin and on a farm that joined to my great-grandfather's land. He was a strawberry grower, a cattleman, and he had a hundred acres of strawberries. And I was born on 40 acres that joined his farm on the northwest uh, and lived there till I was 18 years of age. And then moved to Joplin a year, joined the Navy and I've been everywhere. But I recall preachers, and I grew up in church, John Wesley Methodism. They would preach it and say it. And I, I don't think, I don't remember, let's put it that way, of ever hearing about resurrection except on Easter. We talk about the resurrection on Easter. 
But I'll listen to KWTO. Five sixty on the dial, Springfield, Missouri. Still there. Heard it a lot. Keep watching the Ozarks. And then Springfield was the Assemblies of God headquarters. And I was not an Assemblies of God. I knew nothing about them. But I heard more than one preach on KWTO. Also, in Pittsburgh, Kansas, 860, I think it is, and I heard them there. And they'd, they'd preach, Jesus Christ died for your sins. But I do not remember anyone saying that he was buried with the hell and rose again the third day. In 1965, President Kennedy had been killed in 63 in Dallas. 65, I was so troubled about his death, not because he was Catholic, because he's President of the United States. And I was greatly troubled. 65, I went to the Bible. I grew up on it. And I couldn't find any answers. In 67, I picked it up again. 68 and 69. God was dealing with me about obeying him, which he called me to do when I was 26 years of age. But studying the Bible, I saw these passages in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul, read what you think is appropriate there. I'm just going to start in verse 1. Good. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, Amen. as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Isn't that incredible? Amen. I saw that years ago, back in the 70s, when I was studying the Bible. May have seen it earlier, but no, it's got to be 70s. But I immediately started thinking about American preachers and what I've heard them preach. And I've listened to Pentecostal, Baptist, Methodist, priest, Catholic, Episcopalian, Church of Christ. It doesn't matter. I've listened to all of them. And I, I tell you, many of them still follow what they do. But over the years, I've heard many of them preach 
Did you die for your sin? I've been on radio since 1981, television since 1984, preaching that Jesus Christ died was for your sins, was buried, went to hell, rose again the third day. Amen. Ascended into heaven. Amen. And American preachers, I haven't heard any of them do what Ezekiel Goody did from Africa. Ezekiel Goody, a good friend of mine, stayed in my own. And you've heard, well, I'll tell it. He was riding with me one day. He said, you know, you're a very bold man. We were in my pickup, I think. And I said, nothing. I just kept looking forward. I said, Jesus died for my sins. He's married. He rose again the third day. According to Scripture. He did that, I believe it was four times. I answered the fourth time. And he said, well, my goodness, that's a gospel. Why don't we preach it? One year later, Ezekiel called me. He said, I've made 3,000 video, one hour video on what the gospel is. And I'm giving it to 3,000 preachers. 3,000 preachers. I wonder which one of you preachers, which one of you seminaries, which one of you Bible schools, which one of you churches have ever made 3,000 videos on the gospel and gave it away? I just wonder if anyone did. Thank God. Well, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ is not risen, then we're still dead. We're still in our sins. And I will tell you what I said last night on my webpage. America, you have been deceived. From the pulpits, from television, radio, churches, everywhere. You have been deceived. God forgive us, all of us, for what we've done. Amen. I have to admit, I never preach what you call the gospel. What somebody says, that's half gospel. No, if it's not full gospel, it's no gospel. So don't give yourself credit for preaching the half gospel. I heard in the 70s, twice, God was teaching me, heard a prophecy that God's going to restore to the church, apostle, prophet, a teacher, master, evangelist. And then, I watched the charismatics say, now listen, we got the teacher, we got the pastor, and we got the evangelist. Now we need the apostle and prophet. My friend, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, God set first in the church apostle, secondarily prophet, thirdly teacher. And out of that apostle and prophet's heart came the teacher, the pastor, and the evangelist. I listened to your deceit and lies in the 70s because you were didn't want to offend somebody with a big congregation and called themselves 
a pastor. They are false shepherd. That's what they are. What time is it? 11.25. Thank God. You know why I've been rejected? The gospel I preach has been rejected almost entirely in America. You want to know why? Because the messenger was a veterinarian and not submitted to any mainline organization. A veterinarian that God called before he became a veterinarian in 1958. University of Missouri campus. That's why you're rejected. No, thank you, Lord. You know why you rejected what I preach and believe. What's next? I don't know. <laughs> well, praise God. Thank God. I will just say, I wanted to read those first few verses in 1 Corinthians because it gives the definition of the gospel. And then it says he was, Jesus was seen of the 12 and then the 500 after he is risen from the dead. So that right there is your proof that he is risen from the dead. That's right. You obey God. Amen. It's beautiful. Thank God. Thank God. This is amazing. Do we have a recorded song of my sister, Glenda Shane, called what? Mansion? Over the hilltop. It's what it is, isn't it? Do we have that? Yes. Well, let's put it on. He's getting it ready. Goodness <laughs> sakes. Amen.
You know, that girl was raised in church as I was, same church, same organization. When she was 17 years old, she was singing in Ritchie Church, Ritchie, Missouri, in a church that her uncle and my uncle established and built. Lloyd Davidson, 10 years older than my dad. And he built that church, started it, and he built several of them. Thank God. And Glenda was singing a song in that church, and the Lord saved her singing. Amen. I'll have to notify her that she was on today. She should have been listening <laughs> or watching. What time is it? 11.32. I love that girl. I was 14 when she was born. And my older sister, three years older than me, and me, and Betty, three years and three months younger than me. And God knew that mother and dad were going to live a long time. Dad, 88, mother, 89. He brought Glenda on. And she married a dairy farmer in Brystadt, Missouri, Anchor Shane. Uh, one of the best dairy farms, great farmers, top farmers. That Brystadt area uh, is full of very good and wealthy farmers. And she married Edgar, and they operated that dairy for years. Now her and Edgar, well, I don't know what they do, but their son and daughter-in-law manage a dairy, over 100 head of milkers, of, of Holsteins in the milk line, a large, farm, 150 acres of corn where they do silage so forth. It's amazing. Uh, one of the best farmers in that area. I thank God. God did that with Glenda and then Edgar and Glenda was with mother and dad both. But I took care of them to the end. What they needed I just give thanks to Glenda and give thanks to the Lord for raising her up. Amen. Now, I guess, <laughs> amen, I won't do it, but she can do just a closer walk with me pretty well. Amen, we won't do it now. Um, are you through? I'm through. Let's bring Kathy D up here, see what she can do. No talent, what this preacher will do. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Kathy Davidson came right out of this apostle and servant's heart, the gospel, and faith for producing, bringing forth fruit. And here she is. Kathy D., good, good morning. morning. How are you? Doing well. I have two verses that you were talking about that I think we can bring in here okay. that will go with the discussion. First one is Acts 17, 31. And it says, we were you were talking about Jesus being raised from the dead. He had to be. Right. He absolutely had to be. He said, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men. He has given us assurance that our sins are forgiven, that we've been healed, that we've been justified. Why? Because he raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. He has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised Jesus from the dead. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, our sins aren't forgiven, and we're not healed, and we're not, we don't have prosperity. We don't have any of that. Amen. You know what? That's why a bunch of religionists don't have any of that. That's exactly right. Jesus had to be raised from the dead. God didn't raise Jesus because Jesus needed it. 
that was God's sacrifice of Jesus was accepted. Therefore, God raised him from the dead. He said, that's enough. I'm satisfied. Amen. So Jesus was forgiven. He was justified. It says, doesn't Paul say, justified in the spirit. You know what Acts 4 says? The apostles preached the resurrection. That's right. That's the gospel. That's exactly right. Well, Paul read it in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, I've delivered unto you, which I've also received, how that Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised again. It is necessary we have to preach the resurrection. And Paul said in Galatians 1, 8, But if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, then what ye we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He said that twice. I have to tell you, Anna, uh, I got to be nice. A woman that criticized my book. He rose again. I said, well, let me tell you something. It's in the Bible. And it just might be that God knows how to speak better than you do. Amen. She probably wouldn't even talk to me today. <laughs> but I said, I will not change that title. Why? Because it says he rose again. Right? That's right. Now, would you turn to the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, about 31, 2, 3, 4, 5, and see how the apostles preached the resurrection? Absolutely. No, I'm in a good spirit this morning. Amen. 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 Anybody see it? Verse 33. Okay. Yeah. And great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Right. Amen. Of the resurrection. Of the resurrection. What was it? Read that again. I'll what? read. I'll start from 30, 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were one heart, one soul. Neither did any of them that ought of things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Power is a witness of the resurrection. Right. Right? That's where the power came from. Sure. Absolutely. Right. But that's why the churches are dead. They don't preach the resurrection. That's absolutely the truth. They don't preach the gospel. They'll say, turn to John's gospel. Well, that's nonsense. John's gospel doesn't exist. The book of John does. And in it, you will find the gospel. You'll find results of the gospel. You'll find some results of the gospel that you hate. Amen. Now, I'm really overcoming the spirit in America today, right up here, how they've deceived God's people, preaching that Jesus died for our sins and called that the gospel. You know, one of the greatest experiences I've ever had walking with God was one day I was reading Isaiah 53, and... I, I, it was, it was my background. It was my denominational upbringing. I asked God a question. I said, why did you raise Jesus from the dead? I said, I don't see it. I said, what is the reason you raised Jesus from the dead? I said, why is Jesus not still in hell paying for my sins? I said, it seems to me it would be considering the sins of the world that Jesus would be always in hell paying for our sins. I said, why did you raise him from the dead? And God said to me, your answer is in Isaiah 53, which you're reading. And I read it, and I didn't see it. And I read it, and I didn't see it. And I would read it, and I remember, I was in my bedroom. I would walk around and around and around, and I had my Bible on my dresser. 
and I would walk over, I would read Isaiah 53, and I'd pray. The Spirit of God was strong in my heart. The anointing was pushing it out. And I said, and I would go over and I'd read, and I said, I don't see it. I don't see it. This went on for about an hour and a half. Amen. And then at one point, I was reading. I knew it was in the last part. And I said, uh, I would read, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. I said, I see right there you're talking about the resurrection. But you still haven't told me why. <laughs> I said, you st I see the resurrection in here, but you haven't told me why. This is why I can preach this. Amen. Because I went through it. 11. He's... Uh, he said, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. I saw that word satisfied. Amen. I went, my God, you were satisfied with his sacrifice. But that still doesn't tell me why. And I kept reading and I kept, I mean, I would, it, like I said, an hour and a half, the anointing, God convincing my heart, pushing it out. And finally, I looked down at verse 12 and I saw the first word, therefore. Amen. Therefore, I saw the travail of his soul. I was satisfied with his sacrifice. Therefore, and I mean the joy of the Lord burst through my soul. And I said, now I see it. What was it there? For? Now I see it. Therefore, I rose him from the dead. I raised him from the dead. Amen. The sacrifice, he was satisfied. So he forgave all our sins that moment that Jesus was raised from the dead. That's where our forgiveness came in. That's where our justification it came in when the Father was satisfied. Okay. You know that you're a prophetess. You know that I told you, I think in a way, that you were a prophetess. You already knew it. Right. But if you had anything to say to me, Say it, and I would hear it. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, not too long after that, you moved to Plano. Lived with me. Still do. Amen. We've had some years walking together that probably causes God knows how many religions to stumble. But we have walked in obedience to God, you and I together. And but when you came to my house, our house, now, uh, well, it's in my name. I got some things I believe God wants. When He tells me, I'll do it. All right. Um, I'll, I'll give you the house. You there? I'm right here. Yeah. We've discussed this. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Thank God. But when you came, I told you by the Spirit of God, speak to me. He had something to say. And you started showing me things in the Bible. In the New Testament, Paul's writings that were, it, my eyes were not open to them. You remember what some of them were? One of them. Well, one of them was when I told you about Paul's eyes being affected. Right. Right. Yeah, well, you showed me in Scripture, just like baby did Paul. She ministered to Paul. Right. You ministered to me about affliction and persecution. Right. Right? Colossians, right. Colossians, what? One, 124, I think it is. Yes. Right. Would you read that? Sure will. You showed me that, and I, I thought, my goodness, my goodness. I've taught this Bible all these years, and I never thought that was going to involve me. Verse 24, Colossians 1, it says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, 
which is the church? Afflictions. For what? the sake of the body of Christ. Right. Right. But behind. Right. Right. Which, uh, right. Which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. Right. Right. Paul had to be afflicted for the church. Yeah. Right. Thank you. You get me off the hook. Right. That started with you telling me in my life. It grew immediately. My eyes came under an attack. And it wasn't right after I told you that either. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it was before. Right. But I understood it then. And since that time, down, down, down. To where in 13, I couldn't see anything. 2013, January, just bingo, down. But you want to know something? Now, after seven years, things are coming back. I can see you got on red or pink, right? Right. What? It's close to salmon. It looks that way. Yeah. I just couldn't come up with that word. But that's exactly how it looks to my eye. You know, when I couldn't see anything. Right. And the first thing that showed up was color. I couldn't see anything but color. I knew I wasn't blind. Right. I know something about the eye. I've studied them a lot. But when I, I said, well, I'm not blind because I wouldn't be able to see color. Now, I know you optometrists and ophthalmologists know a lot more than I do, but I still believe I'm not blind. Well, if you look at that in, in Galatians 4, when Paul says, when I came to you at first, so he was... It, obviously, he had an effect on his eyes. Right. Because he goes on and he says, you'd have given me your own eyes. Right. He said, I was with you, you know, weakly trembling, my eyes. But notice he said, and that's when he brought them the gospel. Right. So he preached the gospel to them at the first when he was dealing with his, with his eyes. When he was dealing, and, and he goes on later to say, let no man trouble me. So his eyes obviously came from trouble he was having with men. That's exactly. It's a, it's an oppression, right? What's happened to me? Right. In the last eight years, things really got bad for over seven. But now I'm beginning to be. Well, I can see people's flesh. I can see my own. Right. Thank God. I get close. I can tell you got skin. <laughs> Uh, I get close enough, well, I'm, what, four feet from you? Right. And I can see your color on your clothes. You know, so, it, it, I'm go sorry. On, go on, go on. Well, if, if you read about Smith Wigglesworth, there is an argument that he had with his daughter. She was a missionary to Africa, and when she came home, Smith was wearing glasses. And she said, why are you wearing glasses? And and she she said, what is your problem? And he told her, he said, I've got it stopped. Just hush. You said what? I've got it stopped. Just hush. Oh, yeah. He was afflicted with kidney stones often. They said he would have to deal with the, the kidney stones. And, and, and he talks about taking on the afflictions of the people. And he would just tell people, just relax. I'm okay. Right. Daughters have a tendency to tell dads. Right. I've got one that thinks she's right and she's not. And I know many have thought I had some kind of sins because of my eyes. Well, I do, your sins. Amen. But I'm putting them off. Putting them off. How great it is to know and I'm putting people's sins open my soul. Right. What are you going to say? Well, 
Galatians 4, Paul speaking, verse 14. Well, actually, I'll put go, verse 12. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as you are. You have not injured me at all. You know how, through the infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel to you at the first. He said, and my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record, if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So he, obviously the temptation in his flesh was in his eyes. Right. But he was preaching them the gospel. Right. And then he goes on later and he says, you see how with my own hand I wrote this letter. So he could obviously see. And he said, from henceforth, let no man trouble me. No man trouble me. You know, if when we were, when God was first revealing this to me or showing me, he gave me Psalm 6, 7, Psalm 31, 9, Psalm 38, 10, Psalm 69, 3, Psalm 119, 82, Psalm 119, 123, all talking about the psalmist having difficulty seeing, having the problem with their eyes. In Psalm 40, Jesus showed me he couldn't see on the cross. There came Amen. a point he could not see. Well... You know, my eyes, my visions, coming back. Coming back. I can see things better. Thank God. I, I went to Kroger's with you the other night. That's right. I haven't been to the grocery store in more than three years. I said, I want to go. And I got behind that cart, and I pushed that thing, and I couldn't see much, but I could see something. But you were walking beside me, and you only guided me a couple, three times. Right, just to turn the corners and such. Right. And what people don't realize, there were days you couldn't even have walked behind the cart. There were days that I got lost in my own kitchen. Yes. At the top of the stairs was the scariest day I ever had. In my house that I bought in 2000. Four in Plano, and I got lost. I didn't know where I was at because of the oppression. I was afraid to move, right? Because I didn't know where I was at. I got lost in this church one day, right? I was walking from the west side to the east. And I walked through a door. I didn't know where I was at. And Sharon Brockett came by God's center. I was lost and full of fear. Full of fear. And she got me out. But you know what? A lot of that fear is leaving. That's right. Oh, thank God. Well, you talked about Psalm 143 and Psalm 55 about being overwhelmed. Right. The spirits will overwhelm you. You know, people scoff at that. Well, you know, I'm blood bought. I'm, you know, all that kind of thing. Well, Jesus was overwhelmed. It says when he was in hell, he, he couldn't get himself out. He said, the spirits have overwhelmed me. I can't get out. And the father went and got him. Right. Well, that's who's bringing me out. Right. And I, I'm going to be happy when I can jump off this platform again. Amen. You know, I used to just jump. I used to jump up on it. Yep. Still will. So what else you got? Well, it's 11.55. Do you want me to preach the gospel or you want to continue talking? No, nope, you got five minutes. All right, I can do that. Or six, seven. <laughs> Let's go to Isaiah 53. We've been talking about Isaiah 53 and 52, and we are in verse 8. I thank God for this. I tell you what, God is really opening this stuff up to me even more. And every, every day when I go in to get ready, he talks to me first. Who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? This chapter is talking about Jesus. He refers to it in the New Testament, and so does Paul, so does Peter. They all refer to Isaiah. In verse 8, it says, He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken if you look at that first part he was taken 
from prison and from judgment. That word from prison is oppression. And that judgment, I, I go to Jesenius's lexicon. It's a Hebrew Chaldee lexicon. And it takes, the, it takes Strong's word, but it goes and tells you what in the context it is of what the definition is. It's just a little bit more precise. And it right. opens up a lot to the heart. And in Jesenius, that word uh, judgment means punishment. Punishment. So he was taken with, with oppression and punishment. And who shall declare his generation? If you go to the NIV, it says by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. He was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. Cut off. Go with me to Romans 11, 22. It talks about being cut off. And when God refers in the word of God of cut off, it's not a pretty picture. When you are cut off, it doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Cut off means you're cut off from the Father. And there is only one eternal life, Jesus said, is being with the Father in Jesus. That's eternal life. If you're cut off from the Father, you are cut off from eternal life. You are in hell. In uh, Romans 11:22, it says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. Amen. On them which fell, the, and it's talking about the Jews falling from Jesus, from them which fell severity, but toward thee, the Gentiles that believe the gospel goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, if we keep believing, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Thou also shall be cut off. Being cut off from the Father, being cut off from Jesus is hell. That's eternal hell. That's eternal damnation. Amen. So when the Isaiah 53 talks about Jesus being cut off, he's cut off from the Father. He is cut off from eternal life. He's cut off from heaven. When you are cut off from the Father, you go to hell. Turn with me to Psalm 88. It says, Jesus, Jesus in hell. He said, O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles. That word is evil. Jesus had our evil on him. And my life draweth nigh unto the grave. I am counted with them that go down into the pit. Does that sound like heaven? I am counted like them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave. Whom thou rememberest no more. They are cut off from thine hand. That's where Jesus went when he was cut off from the land of the living. He went to hell. And if you go back to Isaiah 53, it says he was cut off out of the land of the living. Now look at the next word. For. For. Because. Why was Jesus cut off out of the land of the living? Why was Jesus going to the pit? For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Amen. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He didn't go to hell because of himself, because of something he did. And it says it right here. He went to hell because of the transgression of my people. Amen. Because he had our transgressions on him. He had our iniquity on him. He had everything bad about us on him. And that's why he was sent to hell. And look at the next statement. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Stricken. If you look that up in Jesenius, or just, yeah, Jesenius, that word stricken means a strike and a blow from God. From God. Who sent Jesus to hell? God did. It says, because for the transgression of my people was he stricken. God inflicted hell on Jesus because of our sin. Jesus had to pay for our sin and hell. Amen. And it says that God afflicted him with being stricken, sending him for us because of our transgressions. Jesus died. It says it right in here, this verse. Jesus died a sinner. And where do sinners go? They go to the lowest pit the lowest pit, and Jesus went to the lowest pit for us. But thank God, like we talked about earlier, the Father was satisfied with what he paid for us, and he raised Jesus from the dead. And the moment he raised Jesus from the dead, we were raised with him. Amen. Amen.
You quit? I'm done. The gospel was just preach. Just speak the word Jesus after me, and you'll be saved, born again. Jesus, 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 Jesus,